Chapter 43 The abandoned camp told them little that they didn't already know. They walked through the areas of flattened grass where tents had been pitched, inspected the blackened circles left by a score of small cook fires, and examined the small items that had been discarded or forgotten. A shoe here with a broken strap and holes in the underside that were past repairing, a rusted cookpot, a broken knife, and of course, food scraps and garbage that had been hastily buried and dug up once more by foxes after the people had left. The ground was soft, and there were still footprints in evidence round the camp. These showed that a reasonable proportion of the people who had stopped here had been women. All the more reason to believe these are converts, Holt said. Malcolm agreed, but raised a further point. Still, women or not, a hundred people is rather a large handful for the four of us to take on. Do you have any ideas how we're going to handle that task? Simple, Holt told him. We'll surround them. And he said it with such a straight face that, for a moment, Malcolm actually thought he was serious. There was one item of interest to be found, and that was the direction Tennyson and his newly augmented band of followers had taken when they broke camp and departed. After several weeks of travelling consistently to the southeast, Tennyson now swung to the left, heading due east. The small party gathered round Holt as he unfolded his chart of the area. He indicated a range of hills marked on the map a day's journey away to the east. Looks as if he's heading for these hills, as we thought. Horace, craning to read the map over his shoulder, read the notation on the map where Holt was pointing. Caves, he said. Holt looked up and nodded. Those old sandstone cliffs and hills will be honeycombed with them, according to what it says here. Malcolm asked to see the map, and when Holt handed it over, he studied it for some minutes, tracing a path with his finger here, frowning as he read a notation there. Finally, he looked up at Holt. This is quite amazing, he said. There's so much detail here. How did you come by this? Holt smiled and took the map back and folded it carefully. It's part of what the Ranger Corps does, he told the healer. For the past 25 years or so, we've kept ourselves busy updating maps of the kingdom. Each ranger is responsible for his own area of operations, and we send updated charts to Crowley each year. He has them copied and distributed. Malcolm nodded. Ah, yes, I know Crowley. He contacted me shortly after Will spent time with us. He was interested to know more about my healing practices. He said he was going to do that, Will put in. He remembered telling Holt and Crowley about Malcolm during his debriefing session. They were interested in the healer's medical skills, and the other skills of deception and illusion that he had demonstrated. Knowing Malcolm... Will had been confident that he would share his medical skills with them, but not the other skills, which were his alone. In any event, Holt said, bringing matters back to the present, I'd wager this is where Tennyson is heading. Yes, Malcolm agreed. If he's planning to set up a headquarters and add to his band of followers, a nice cave complex would be as good a place as any. Well, standing here isn't going to get us any closer to him, Holt said. We've given him too much of a lead already. He strode back to where Abelard waited for him and mounted quickly. Then he waited impatiently while the others followed his example. Will noticed him fidgeting with his reins as he watched Malcolm make two unsuccessful attempts to mount behind Horace. For God's sakes, Horace! Holt finally cried out. Can't you just haul him up behind you? Take it easy, Will said softly. Holt looked at him quickly, then gave him a shamefaced smile. Sorry, he said. It's just that after all these delays, I'm anxious to catch up with him. But it was that very anxiety and eagerness to close with Tennyson 
that eventually let him down. Holt was pushing himself too hard. Under normal circumstances, he would have had no trouble keeping up to the pace he was setting. But he wasn't fully recovered from the effects of the poison, or the days lying close to death in his blankets. Holt had used up a large part of his natural energy reserves, and it would take more than a day or two to restore them. That evening, when they camped, he slid from the saddle and stood, head bowed and exhausted. When Will went to unsaddle and water Abelard, he offered only token resistance. Will and Horace took care of the minor chores, gathering firewood, building the fire and preparing the meal. Horace even set out Holt's bedroll and blankets for him, laying them out on a small pile of leafy branches that he gathered together. Holt reacted with surprise when he saw it. Thanks, Horace, he said, touched by the young warrior's concern for him. Horace shrugged. Think nothing of it. They noticed that when the meal was done, and after the obligatory cups of coffee, Holt didn't linger round the campfire talking, as he would usually do. He took himself off to his bedroll and slept soundly. The sleep of the exhausted, Malcolm said wryly, eyeing the still figure. Is he all right? Will asked anxiously. He's fine, so far as the poison is concerned. But he's working himself too hard. He doesn't have the strength to keep this pace up. See if you can get him to ease up a little. He knew that if the suggestion came from Will, there was more chance that Holt might take heed. Will wasn't so sure. I'll try, he said. But the following morning, refreshed by a long night's sleep, Holt wasn't in any mood to take things easily. He fussed and fretted while they had breakfast and packed up their camp. Then he mounted Abelard and set out at a cracking pace. By eleven that morning, he was swaying in the saddle, his face grey with fatigue, his shoulders slumped. Will rode up beside him, leaned over, and seized Abelard's reins, bringing the little horse to a stop. Holt shook himself out of the exhausted days that had claimed him, and looked around in surprise. "'What are you doing?' he asked. "'Let go of my reins!' He tried to pull the reins out of Will's grip, but the young ranger held firm. Abelard neighed in consternation, sensing that all wasn't well with his master. Halt! You have to slow down, Will told him. Slow down? Don't talk such nonsense. I'm fine. Now give me back those reins. Halt tried again to pull the reins from Will's grasp, but realised with some surprise that he couldn't break his former apprentice's grip. Abelard, sensing the tension between them, neighed nervously. Then he shook his mane and turned his head so that he could look Holt in the eye. That was something else that surprised Holt. Normally, if someone had grabbed hold of his reins, Abelard would have reacted violently against them. Instead, in this confrontation, he seemed to be taking Will's side. That, more than anything else, made Holt feel that perhaps Will was right. Perhaps he hadn't recovered as fully as he thought. Time was that he would have shaken off the effects of the poisoning in a matter of a few hours. But perhaps that time was behind him. For the first time, Holt had a sense of his own limitations. At Malcolm's urging, Horace brought Kicker up alongside Abelard, on the other side to tug and Will. Will's right, he said. You're pushing too hard. If you keep this up, you'll have a relapse. And that will lose more time than if you simply take a little time to recover now, Malcolm put in. Holt glared from one to the other. What is this? he asked. Are you all conspiring against me? Even my horse? It was the last three words that made Will smile. We figured you mightn't listen to a healer, a ranger or a knight of the realm, he said. But if your horse agreed with them, you'd have no choice but to pay attention. 
In spite of himself, Holt couldn't help the faintest hint of a smile touching his own mouth. He tried to hide it, but the corners of his mouth twitched defiantly. He realised, when he considered the position honestly, that his friends weren't urging him to rest in order to annoy him. They were doing so because they cared about him, and they were worried about him. And he realised that he respected their judgement enough to admit that perhaps they might be right, and he might be wrong. And there were very few people who could bring Holt to admit that. Holt, you need to rest. If you'll just stop being stubborn and admit it, we'll make better time in the long run. Stay here for a day. Get your strength back. Horace and I can push on ahead and scout the situation. If you're right, Tennyson will have set up at these caves, so there's no rush anymore to catch up with him. Will's tone was reasonable, not argumentative, and he saw from Holt's body language that he was on the brink of giving in. Sensing that he needed just one more mental shove, Will provided it, invoking the ultimate authority in the bearded ranger's world. You know Lady Pauline would agree with me, he said. Holt's head jerked up at the name. Pauline? What does she have to do with this situation? Will held his gaze steadily. If you continue the way you are, I'll have to go back and face her and tell her I failed in the task she set me. Holt opened his mouth to reply, but words failed him. He closed his mouth again, realising how foolish he must look. Will seized the opportunity to continue. And if you continue like this and run yourself into the ground, I'm not going to have the nerve to face her. Holt considered that statement and slowly nodded his head. He could understand Will's sentiments there. No, he said thoughtfully, I shouldn't imagine you would. Then, to Malcolm's surprise, Holt slowly dismounted. Well, he said mildly, Perhaps I should rest up for a day or so. I wouldn't want to overdo things. He looked around, saw a small grove of trees a few metres away from the track they had been following, and nodded towards them. I suppose that's as good a place to camp as any. Will and Horace exchanged relieved glances. Before Holt could change his mind, they dismounted and began to set up camp. Holt now that he had given in to their concerns, decided he might as well take advantage of the situation. He found a fallen tree and sat down by it, resting his back against it and letting out a small sigh. I'll start getting my strength back straight away, he told them, a satisfied smile on his face. Horace shook his head as he and Will began to gather stones for a fireplace. Even when he gives in, he has to have the last word, doesn't he? He said. Will smiled in reply. Every time. But he felt a sense of relief that Holt was willing to stop pushing himself to the limit. Malcolm, on the other hand, was intrigued to learn more about the person whose name could bring Holt to such a state of meek compliance. He sidled up to Will as the young man was unstrapping his camping equipment from Tug's saddle. This Lady Pauline, he began, she must be a fearful person. She sounds like a terrible sorceress. His face was deadpan, but Will sensed the underlying amusement and replied in kind. She's very slim and beautiful, but she has amazing power. Some time ago, she convinced Holt to have a haircut for their wedding. Malcolm, who had noticed Holt's decidedly slapdash hairstyling, raised his eyebrows. A sorceress, indeed, 